Hello students. Today we're going to be talking about chapter one, which is our basic introduction chapter to the human body and going over some terminology and some basic physiology that will be a constant theme through our book. So first of all, we need to know the difference between anatomy and physiology. These are are two separate fields of sciences. We're learning them all in one course. Anatomy is the study of structures in the body. What are the structures? What are the organs? What do they look like? Where are they in relation to other structures in the body? So being able to identify the anatomical features of the body is going to be important in this course. Physiology, on the other hand, is the study of how the structures or the organs function. It's a study of the function. So what you see on this simple table here are different fields or branches of anatomy that can be fairly specific. The anatomy of the embryo, um, embryology, developmental biology, cell biology, all of these different things are different fields of anatomy. Likewise, we have different fields of physiology that can be fairly specific. We can have molecular physiology. What are the functions of the various biomolecules in the cells? We have neurophysiology. We have a whole chapter on that. Endocrinology, which you'll learn in AMP2 so forth and so on, there are different fields of physiology. But nonetheless, the basic difference is that one, we're learning the anatomy, the structure, where it is, what does it look like, in relation to other structures around it. The physiology is what we're going to be learning when we're learning how the structures or, or organs function in order to keep us healthy. The next section in the chapter, uh, with a little brief overview, is the structural level of organization in our body. Kind of a recap from general biology. So the basic levels start from the simplest, which will be the chemical level, all the way to the most complex level, which is the organismal level, which is obviously the person. The chemical level includes the elements, atoms of all the elements that can bond together to form different molecules. Here they show a molecule of DNA. Anything dealing with the elements and the atoms and various molecules, the biomolecules you learned about, DNA, which is a nucleic acid, proteins made of amino acids, water, H2O, and whatever the case may be, that is all within the chemical level. Now, above the chemical level, our next more complex level of organization, it gets more complex the higher up we go, is called the cellular level of organization, which includes the cells in the body. This shows a smooth muscle cell, one of the cell types, or tissue types and cell types we're going to be learning. The cell level of organization encompasses the chemical level. The interaction of all of these chemicals within a cell is what brings about life. Life actually starts at the cellular level. So the smallest living unit in the body is a cell. Below the cell level, which, is, which are all the molecules and chemicals, all of these things are not alive. So DNA is not a living structure. It's a molecule. But the interaction of how these molecules work and why we learn molecular physiology brings about life at the cell level. So if a cell dies, then there's no more life. Uh, you know, like in a single cell organism. Now, as we go to the next higher level of organization, which is more complex even yet, it encompasses many of the same cells together, which is called a tissue. The tissue level of organization 
includes similar cells that perform similar tasks all in one place. There are four basic types of tissue that forms everything in our body, and we'll learn that in Chapter 4. From this level, we go to the next more complex level, which is the organ level in our body. Here they show the stomach. The stomach, as you know, is one of the organs in the digestive system. And at the organ level, the organ level of organization is classified as that because organs have organs have recognizable shapes. So the stomach is sort of this J shape. So all the organs in the body have a recognizable shape that after you study it, you'll, you'll recognize it according to shape and location with respect to other organs in the body. Organs also are made up of two or more different types of tissue. So the stomach has all four types of tissue in it. There's some epithelial tissue that lines the stomach. There's muscle tissue. There's some nerves that run through and around the, the organ. There's some connective tissue. So there are many types of tissue that make up the stomach. And since it's made up of more than two types, two or more types of tissue is considered to be an organ. Now, the next higher level of organization is a system level. Here they show the digestive system. The stomach is part of the entire system. Collectively together, the different organs in the system, here they show salivary glands, they show the esophagus, the tube we swallow through, so forth and so on, the liver, the stomach, intestine. All of these organs have their own shapes and they have their own functions. But collectively together, if all of these organs and structures are functionally, functioning, functioning correctly, then the entire organ system is functioning correctly and we stay healthy. If cells fail at the organ level with any one of these organs or the organ fails collectively together, then you're not healthy. The system's not doing its job. The next higher level includes you, the organism, which includes 11 different body systems. We, as the organismal level of organization, is the most complex level out of all of these levels. So there are 11 body systems that make up our entire body. These 11 body systems are outlined in the beginning of your chapter. It's not my goal to make you learn every single thing about all of the systems now we're going to learn some introductory material because that's what a whole year of anatomy is for because over the course of the next year amp1 and amp2 you're going to be learning all of these systems everything about them and what they do but for now i want you to at least review these sections in your book i want you to know what the basic components are in a system for instance here the integumentary system includes your skin. Everybody kind of knows that. Your skin is the largest organ in the body. It also includes accessory structures, so it's not just your skin, but associated structures like hair, fingernails, toenails, glands like sweat glands and oil glands. All of these associated with the entire system, with the skin. I also want you to know the basic function of the system. So what you should do is get a notebook out, write down integumentary system, write down there, list out the components, skin, hair, nails, sweat glands, oral glands, and then write down some basic functions, protects the body, regulates our temperature, helps eliminate certain waste and perspiration. Uh, it's involved in the production of vitamin D. So just list them out. As we get to each chapter, which covers each system, we're going to be learning a lot more detail about each one. So here you see we have the integumentary system, all the outside of the body, the skeletal system composed of the, bo the bones and joints and various cartilaginous pads throughout the body, the muscular system, including the skeletal muscles which we see on the outside that control our movements around our body, but we also have two other types of muscle tissue in the body we'll be learning about 
in chapter 4 and in chapter 10. The nervous system, which includes your brain and your spinal cord and all of the nerves that run through the body with their sensory organs that allow us to sense changes in our environment, the external environment and the internal environment. The endocrine system, which will be covered in AMP2, contains all of the glands that produce hormones in the body. So we're just learning the basics about this now. We have a whole chapter on this later. And hormones are chemical mediators that basically regulate physiological processes in the body. So the two systems in the body that regulate all of our physiology, that is to say, if our heart rate has to go up, or our heart rate has to go down, or any other physiological response you could think of is regulated by the endocrine system and the nervous system. Those are the two systems in the body that control all of our physiology in our body. <clears throat> the cardiovascular system is composed of the blood running through the blood vessels, and the heart pumps your blood through those blood vessels. So here you see arteries and veins running through the body. We also have a system called the lymphatic system, a fairly obscure system that people typically don't know too much about as of yet unless you've studied it already. We're going to learn what this system is in AMP2 as well. The system is composed of a fluid called lymphatic fluid. Um, it is formed from a filtration product of actually plasma from our blood. That fluid runs through special vessels called lymphatic vessels. And then we have specialized lymphatic organs. You might recognize some of these, like your spleen, you might recognize that name. And lymph nodes, people typically know that. These specific types of organs in the body is where we carry out immune responses, amongst other types of functions dealing with our immune system cells. The respiratory system includes your lungs, it includes your throat, which is called our pharynx, your voice box, which is the larynx, your windpipe, which is the trachea, and then all of the tubes that allow air to go in and out of our lungs is called the, are called the bronchial tubes. The digestive system, which we just saw a picture of briefly, going over the org, uh, structural organizational levels, um, is the system where we bring food into our body, where it's involved in breaking that food down chemically as well as physically, and then allowing for the nutrients from our food to be absorbed into the cardiovascular system. The urinary system is composed of your kidneys, which filter your blood to remove the waste products, uh, tubes called ureters, that transports the waste product called urine from the kidneys down to our temporary storage site called the urinary bladder. And then a final tube called the urethra, which carries urine out of the body when you go to the bathroom. The reproductive systems include the female and the male reproductive systems. And the, the reproductive systems have uh, structures in them, the gonads, where the gametes will be produced like sperm from the testicles in the male, eggs from the ovaries in the females, and um, various other structures that allow reproduction to occur for the perpetuation of the species. So we're going to learn about all of these structures that are components of both of these systems in AMP2, and the system obviously is required in order for us to maintain human life on the planet. Continuing with that thought, in order for all living things to live, certain life processes have to be performed. So there are some important life processes in the human that I want to focus on, since this is human AMP, and I'll mention them, sorry, I'll mention them briefly. Metabolism is a word used to describe all of the chemical reactions that occur in our body. There are two basic classifications of those reactions. Some of the chemical reactions 
are involved in building large complex molecules from simpler ones, which we would call a building block. I don't know if you remember from general biology, but the individual building blocks are called monomers, and they can be bonded together to make large complex molecules we call polymers. So that group of chemical reactions, which are part of metabolism, is called anabolism, or we would just say anabolic reactions. For instance, everybody knows the word protein. Proteins are long, complex molecules, so that would be the polymer. The building block that makes up that polymer are referred to as amino acids. So we have to acquire amino acids, some of them in our diet, some of them our body can make. You'll learn more about that in your nutrition class. But there are basically 20 different types of amino acids that can be built into proteins. And so anabolic reactions are involved in building up these complex molecules from their simpler building blocks or their monomers. Now, responsiveness is a common theme through the whole book, AMP1, AMP2. In order for us to survive, we have to be able to do two things, really. We have to be able to sense when a condition changes. And we have to be able to respond to that change in an appropriate manner in order to maintain the health of our body. So what do I mean by sensing changes in conditions? Well, the last part of this chapter that we're going to cover in a second covers basically reflexes, or what we call homeostatic feedback loops. And so in order for us to survive, we have to know when conditions increase or conditions decrease. Those conditions can be on the inside of our body, which we call our internal environment, and I'll show you that in a second. Or the conditions on the outside of our body can change as well, and we have to be able to react and respond to those in order to stay healthy. So that would be called our external environment. So sensing and responding to changes in our environment is very important. I typically give a pretty easy analogy for that. Let's say that you're walking across the street. You're about to walk across the street. But all of a sudden, you hear a horn. Well, you know you're about to walk across the street. And you hear the horn, which means you're signified that you have to change what you were about to do. You know a car is coming. So what do you do? You stop and you look. You just sensed a change in the environment. The car honking was auditory stimulation. You might have seen it as well, but you sensed the change. You responded to that change in an appropriate manner so that you do not get hurt walking across the street you know, from the car coming. Now, that's a simple example. We're going to focus a lot of our efforts in AMP on the internal environment. What types of conditions change on the inside of our body? Do they go up? Do they go down? And how do we bring those conditions back within normal ranges is the response. So responsiveness is pretty important. Now, movement at all levels. Cells move around our body. Chemicals inside of cells move around, so movement is going to be important. You physically move around in order to interact, live day to day. Movement is important. Growth and differentiation allow for us to reach sexual maturity. So we grow from a baby. We go through puberty. We start to become an adult. We're an adult. That growth has to happen in order for us to be able to reach sexual maturity in order to reproduce. So reproduction is a very important process to maintain life, human life on the planet, as all life. We have to reproduce. 
our children will carry on the day, so to speak. Now, let's talk about homeostasis and the fluids in the body. Homeostasis basically is a state of well-being. Are you healthy or are you not healthy? Homeostasis is a condition of equilibrium and balance in the body, in our internal environment. We have a whole bunch of different types of conditions called controlled conditions that have to be maintained within normal ranges. For instance, we're going to talk about blood pressure as our example in a minute. Everybody knows blood pressure a little bit. Blood pressure is a controlled condition. We don't want it too high, but you don't want it too low. That means there is a normal physiological limit, a range that it has to be within in order for us to stay healthy. So if, it, if all of our conditions, like blood pressure and other ones, are within our normal ranges, then you are considered to be in homeostasis. So we have to go over throughout a year of anatomy and physiology Physiological reflex loops. Reflex loops, which are called homeostatic feedback loops, that are responsible for maintaining our controlled conditions within normal ranges. So we're going to be introduced to that today. And we're going to carry on that particular conversation through the course of AMP1 and AMP2. Now, the next thing that we have to consider are the various types of fluid compartments in the body. Where the fluid is in our body. So, ultimately there are three basic fluid compartments. Those three basic fluid compartments can actually be separated into two main groups. So let's consider this. Look at this simple picture over here. On one side of the picture, the artist drew some cells in here, right? There's some body cells in there. On the inside of those cells, we have what you learned of as cytoplasm in general biology. There's water in there. It's a fluid compartment inside of our cells. The fluid compartment on the insides of our cells is referred to as our intracellular fluid. Intra, I-N-T-R-A, cellular, intracellular fluid. Intracellular just means on the inside of the cell. Now, all of the other fluid in our body is on the outside of all the cells. So that fluid compartment is called the extracellular fluid or some other names can define it. So the fluid on the outside of all the cells are called extracellular. The term extracellular means outside of cells. It's also called interstitial fluid. The interstitial fluid, that term, inter, I-N-T-E-R, means between, and stitial means tissue cells, tissue. So the fluid between the tissue cells. So we have a couple of names for extracellular fluid. Interstitial fluid is the specific name for the extracellular fluid on the outside of the tissue cells around the body, everywhere. But we also have the fluid on the inside of our cardiovascular system, which is part of blood. The liquid part of blood is called plasma. So technically, plasma is an extracellular fluid. It's on the outside of all of the blood cells that are flowing in your cardiovascular system. But we give it its own name. We call it blood plasma. Now, this extracellular fluid, the interstitial fluid between all the tissue cells, the blood plasma, running in the cardiovascular system, 
is what we call our internal environment. The chemical composition of our interstitial fluid and our blood plasma is essential to maintain life. We're going to talk about all sorts of different chemicals that are in those fluids, various ions, nutrients. What is the pH of those fluids? You might remember here in pH in general biology. So all of these conditions, the concentrations of ions, nutrients, waste products, medicines you're taking, some people taking illicit drugs, hopefully not, but that's all in there. All of these compounds have to be regulated in this fluid because those chemicals are transferred from one compartment to another one. So let's look at the compartments. So one fluid compartment is basically inside our blood vessels, the cardiovascular system. That's our blood plasma. All of your nutrients and respiratory gases like oxygen, waste gas, CO2, all your nutrients and waste products and respiratory gases and medicines you might be taking are exchanged to and from the blood, plasma, and the interstitial fluid. From the interstitial fluid, we also have an exchange. From the interstitial fluid, chemicals, solutes, respiratory gases, nutrients, waste products, all are interchanged to and from the intracellular fluid of the cells and the interstitial fluid. So we have movements of water and all of these chemicals to and from the blood plasma to the interstitial fluid to the cells from the intracellular fluid in the cells back to the inter interstitial fluid back to the plasma. These are the three major fluid compartments where chemicals and solutes will be moving along with water and our respiratory gases and everything else we'll be learning. So we have to maintain the composition of these fluids in order for our cells to stay healthy. I'll give you a simple example for now. You can have a water shift from your blood to the interstitial fluid and from the interstitial fluid into the cells. We typically want to maintain a normal fluid volume movements from one compartment to the other one so that the volume stays about the same. But there are certain conditions where more water can leave the blood to enter a tissue and you get a swollen part of your body. So when you get stung or a mosquito bite or something, you get a welt, it swells up. Where do you, what do you think is causing that swelling? It's excess fluid going into, from the blood, into the tissue space, causing the tissue to swell up. Now, in some cases like that example, we actually want that to happen. That's called inflammation. We'll talk about that later. But there are problems that can arise from other things that can actually cause death if fluid, too much fluid enters the cells in our body. We don't want the volume of our cells increasing too much because they would blow up like an overfilled water balloon, but we don't want it decreasing either because they would shrivel up when they're too dehydrated. So we have to control that water movement. We're going to talk more about that in AMP2, but we'll be introduced to that in AMP1. All right, so let's talk about homeostasis a little bit more and the types of responses or reflexes that can be initiated. So as you notice here, you'll see some links right here. You have to be connected to the internet. I left these in the PowerPoint so that you can click on them and see animations. The more you look at, the better. AMP is a visual learning subject matter, so you need to make sure you go and review all of these links. You also have access to all of this once you get access to your Wiley Plus. So let's talk about what a homeostatic feedback loop is and what the components of the feedback loop are. So what you see here is a flow chart. A common theme in our book, 
our reflex loops called homeostatic feedback loops will look similar to this. This is a generic one which shows the various structures and uh, areas involved in the reflex. And so first of all, we always start out with a stimulus or what I like to call a stressor. A stressor is anything that can cause a disruption of a controlled condition in our body which disrupts homeostasis. That's what a stress is. So stressors can be emotional stress. It can be physiological, chemical stress. It can be physical trauma. You, somebody fell, broke a bone, a laceration, a burn. It, a stressors are anything that changes certain controlled conditions that alter our homeostatic state. So we always have some stimulus or stressor, which is typically not defined unless I define them for you for particular examples, which I will do throughout the course. And then we have our controlled condition will always be right here. This controlled condition is the condition that has to be maintained within an upper and a lower limit. The upper and lower limits of a condition are called the condition's physiological limits. So we'll always have a high end and a low end for the condition. If we're in the middle, you're healthy. If you're outside of the high end or down below the low end, then you're not healthy, and we better be able to sense if we're higher or lower than normal in order to initiate a reflex loop or homeostatic feedback loop in order to bring the condition back to normal. So in order to do that, we have to have monitors of our condition. The structures in the body that monitor the condition are called receptors. The receptors can send nerve impulses or release chemical signals that allow an input information to go to a control center. The control center is more often than not your brain or areas in our brain, but there are examples where the control center is not in the brain, and we'll learn a couple of those. The control center then has the job of receiving the input, analyzing the signals, and then determining what type of output information is required in order to keep us healthy. So that output information would go to the workers in the body, which are called effectors. Effectors are things, tissues or organs, cells in our body that can bring about a physiological change. A simple example is your heart. We're gonna do that one in a second. So if we have to increase our blood pressure, let's make sure we, we increase cardiac function the control center, in that sense, would send out output information to the heart to say, hey, we need to increase what we're doing in order to increase blood flow and blood pressure. So effectors are the organs and the tissues in the body that can bring about a physiological change and thus induces a response that will alter the controlled condition in some fashion. So let's look at our first homeostatic feedback loop, which is in particular called a negative feedback loop. So we have two different types of homeostatic loops. Some of them are going to be called negative feedback loops, and some of them are going to be called positive feedback loops. We're in fact only going to learn two positive loops. The rest of them will be negative feedback loops. So negative feedback loops actually turn on and turn off on their own in response to a change in a controlled condition. So that's one of the characteristics of a negative loop. They turn on when we need them automatically and they turn off when the condition is back to normal. The other characteristic that's very evident when you look at a flow chart like this is this. If you look up here at the top, we have some stress or stimulus that is disrupting homeostasis by increasing our controlled condition. And in this example, we're learning about blood pressure a little bit. So the start of the loop was that our blood pressure went up, <laughs> probably because you're listening to this video. <laughs> but nonetheless, our, our controlled condition goes up. 
But look what happens through the loop without reading it all the way through yet. After the loop is done, the response of this loop is a decrease in our blood pressure. So negative loops have a response at the end of the loop that is the exact opposite to what started the loop to begin with. So in negative feedback loops, which again I'll say, are the majority of the loops in the body. We're going to learn two. That's about it. So the uh, positive loops. So the majority of all of the loops we're going to learn are negative loops. So the stressor stimulus is going to either increase or decrease the condition, but the response of the loop will be the exact opposite. All right, so let's look at blood pressure for a minute. Some stress is making your blood pressure go up, the controlled condition. Receptors monitor that blood pressure. So the types of receptors in our body that monitor pressure are called baroreceptors. Baroreceptors monitor pressure. They're found in certain blood vessels in your body, like the aorta and your carotid arteries. You might have heard of those before. So those baroreceptors monitor the pressure and they send nerve impulses to the control centers in the brain. That would be called the input information. The brain then analyzes those nerve impulses and determines that, yes, our blood pressure went up. The brain then says, yep, we better do something about it. We don't want that high blood pressure all the time. So the output information, which are nerve impulses, go to the effectors that have the ability to change blood pressure, your heart, and some, certain blood vessels around the body, small arterioles. So what type of output do we get? Well, the output information that goes to your heart is inhibitory. We're going to learn all about that. So certain nerve impulses slow your heart rate down. And if your heart rate slows down, it helps bring down your blood pressure. We also get nerve impulses that go to the small arteries in the body. And if we have to decrease blood pressure in these small vessels, we want to increase their diameter. So we increase the diameter of these vessels, and that lowers the blood pressure inside of that particular vessel in that tissue. And so when you increase the diameter of a vessel, that's called vasodilation. So in this particular reflex loop, homeostatic feedback loop, we're going to decrease cardiac activity and we're going to cause vasodilation. These are the effectors. And by decreasing cardiac activity, basically lowering your heart rate, decreasing the force of contraction of the ventricles, and causing an increase in vessel diameter, vasodilation, that decreases blood pressure. So this loop is going to run and run and run until your blood pressure is back to normal, back within your normal range. So how do we know when that is? The receptors. The baroreceptors are constantly monitoring that pressure. So when the baroreceptors monitor the pressure and signify that the pressure is back down to normal, they send that input information in the form of nerve impulses to the cardiovascular center in the brain, it's in our brain stem, and the brain says, yep, blood pressure's back to normal, and, and they cut off this, this output information. So your heart goes back to doing what it normally does, and your blood vessel size diameter goes back to its normal size, and the loop shuts off. So this is turned on and turned off on its own, all based on what the controlled condition level is. Is it too high? Is it too low? Is it back to normal? That would be a negative feedback loop. The last loop that we have to cover is called a positive loop, a positive feedback loop. So I'll put here the, the link to the animation so you can view that. Positive feedback loops, and this is the first one we're learning, the second one that we'll learn will be an AMP2 dealing with blood clotting. This one deals with the birth of a baby, labor contractions. So here's how this works. 
Oh, first of all, positive feedback loops, when they turn on, they don't automatically turn off. They actually stay on. So something on the outside of the loop has to happen in order to turn the loop off. So let's just go over the loop and I'll explain that. So the controlled condition in this loop for labor contractions is how stretched is the cervix in the female reproductive tract. So the cervix is this most uh, inferior anterior portion of the uterus. The baby's growing inside the uterus. The cervix is the very end of the uterus just before the vaginal canal, which we're not identifying all of that. So at the time when the baby is supposed to be born, the baby is pushing down on that cervix, which stretches it. So the degree to which the cervix is stretched is important. It's an important controlled condition. So as the cervix becomes stretched, there are stretch sensitive receptors in the cervix that fire nerve impulses to the brain, which is the input information. So the brain is receiving this information that the cervix is being stretched. So the brain says, yep, the cervix is stretched. There's a little gland that hangs off the brain. It's called the pituitary gland. The output information from the brain is not a nerve impulse in this reflex, but yet it's a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin is released from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, which we can't see. It hangs off the the inferior portion of the brain. Oxytocin enters the bloodstream and circulates down to its receptors, which are smooth muscle cells in the wall of the uterus. When the smooth muscle cells in the wall of the uterus receive oxytocin, they contract, which is the labor contraction. So the smooth muscle in the wall of the uterus, really that area of the uterus is called the myometrium. Those smooth muscle cells contract and basically try to push the baby into the birth canal. Well, what happens when that contraction occurs and the baby's moving into the birth canal? The baby stretches the cervix even more. So look at the original stimulus. The original stimulus was an increase in the stretch of the cervix. Look at the outcome of the reflex. The outcome of the reflex is an increase in the stretch of the cervix. The cervix stretches even more. So the, cer the, the response of the loop, of a positive loop, actually increases or enhances the original stimulus. So the cervix stretches even more. The stretch receptors send information to the brain. The brain says, yep, the cervix is stretched. So the brain, the pituitary gland, releases oxytocin into the blood, circulates down to the smooth muscle in the myometrium of the uterus. The smooth muscle contracts and forces the baby down through the cervix even more, which stretches the cervix even more, which turns the loop on again, which turns the loop on again, so forth and so on. So this loop is going to run and run and run until something that's not even part of this loop happens in order for the loop to shut off. So what is that? The cycle is interrupted when the baby is delivered and the baby stops stretching the cervix. So the birth of the baby, which if you read all these boxes of the reflex loop, the birth of the baby is not part of the loop at all. That's the ultimate outcome of the loop. And as the loop I mean, as the baby is born, the cervix is not stretched anymore. The stretch receptors then fire impulse to the brain saying, hey, the cervix is not stretched anymore. So the pituitary stops releasing oxytocin. Now, this is partially a neuronal reflex because there's nerve impulses and what we call an endocrine reflex because the lower part of the loop is regulated by a hormone. Endocrine reflexes typically last quite longer than basic 
nerve impulse or neuronal reflexes because the hormones last longer in the body, in the blood. So in this particular reflex, the, the female would deliver the baby, but her uterus would still go through rhythmic contractions after the fact, which is important for two reasons. By the smooth muscle of the, of the uterus contracting, it makes the uterus go back down to its small regular size, and it allows for the birth of the placenta. The placenta has to, has to come out as well. So that's why this loop is important that it runs for a little while longer than, say, a, a, a nervous system regulated impulse, I mean, a reflex that we'll learn later. All right, so that's it for the chapter. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me, um, and I'll be putting out the chapter four video soon.